And freedom is a term that's, you know, banded around a lot now um, and has been for obviously a long, long, long time. But freedom can mean a number of different things. And we need to be clear in Buddhism when we hear this word freedom and also its corollary, um, liberation. What does that actually mean? Well, ordinarily, when, when we talk about freedom or liberation, it usually means that um, up until now we've been oppressed by something um, that we've not been able to do as we wish, uh, and now uh, we are able to do what previously we were unable to do. This is the normal. If we're thinking about, for example, political liberation or political freedoms, this is usually what it means, you know, uh, that we have certain rights to live, to be unmolested, to speak and to uh, make decisions for ourselves in all sorts of different fields and areas, um, unmolested by uh, others or a state or um, a mob or uh, anything else for that matter, and that these rights are protected and enshrined uh, within law. Um, but this isn't the freedom, obviously, that's the uh, that the Buddha is talking about. His is of a different order. It's a, a spiritual freedom. Um, and the giveaway is is this ability to be able to move um, in the four directions. And really, if we contrast that with what happens as we begin to grow up, you know, from a, um, viewed through a Buddhist lens, um, then we begin to see that there's a contrast between this freedom um, of this emerging spiritual consciousness, and then where we end up um, after we've grown up. Um, uh, and if we remember now that in the, uh, if we contrast this, if you like, or, or yes, if we contrast this with, for example, the uh, poem of the third Zen patriarch, Master Sozam, his poem was called On Faith in the Heart, and it begins, the great way is not difficult, it merely avoids picking and choosing. And, you know, we may sort of say, well, picking, we, we should have the freedom to pick and choose. And that's, you know, more along the lines of the sort of political notion of freedom that we were just previously talking about. But the spiritual freedom is actually something else, um, uh, is actually something else uh, uh, instead. And um, in fact, it's the reverse, because if, if we look at Master Sozan, he says the great way, which means the Mahayana or the Buddha's way, we could say the great way is the Buddha's way. The great way is not difficult. It merely avoids picking and choosing. So what is this this picking and choosing? Well, we know um, that the, uh, 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 that the uh, that as we begin to grow older, we have preferences. You know, all our bodies. You know, we our be our being. We have certain preferences. Some of us prefer to drink tea in the morning for breakfast. Others might prefer to drink coffee. Some like to have breakfast. Some prefer not to. These are all choices that we can make, and there's and and they arise out of our uh, preferences. And there's in itself, there's absolutely nothing wrong with those things. The problem begins to arise if something occurs that prevents me from being able to fulfill my choice, to fulfill my expectations of what I think um, I must have. And when that happens, what is the result of that? And I remember many years ago um, when I uh, went to the very first Zen retreat called a session um, and we went away to, in fact, to a, a Christian priory that was run by a, um, an order of nuns, uh, and they used to look after us. And uh, on the session itself, you know, we would sit eight or nine hours of zazen meditation a day. It was a silent retreat, so we couldn't speak. There, were, there was no, we didn't have books. This was well before mobile phones. But nowadays, when we run them, mobile phones are switched off. Um, the whole point of a retreat is to retreat, if you like, from the usual day-to-day -day activities uh, with which I distract myself. And the idea is that we now are here to concentrate and to really give ourselves wholeheartedly into um, a more intensified period of training that's going to go on for, uh, in our case, for about five days. And this is the first time I'd been on a, um, a session and uh, I was feeling pretty nervous about it. Already, I mean, I'd been involved in the group for a couple of years, uh, had a regular Zazen practice, um, was involved obviously in daily life practice as well, and was, con you know, given the okay uh, that I could 
I was now ready to go and was encouraged to go. And uh, because there were quite a lot of us, there were too many to have to for the dormitories. So um, half a dozen of us had to sleep in the uh, uh, in the zendo in the meditation hall. So we had sleeping bags and we sort of piled up the mats and we'd sleep on the mats as well. And in we were given a, a room where we could store all our bags and there was a few chairs there it was our own community room because we didn't have bedrooms like everybody else and um we were you know we could use this anytime we wanted to outside of the formal set sessions and uh, although the whole thing is sort of designed to be both physically and mentally quite taxing you know with its uh, uh, restrictions and its restraints practice of restraint <coughs> Um, the one thing that you do get a lot of is is good food. The sisters cooked um, a lot of homegrown produce, and they were very generous indeed. And there was always plenty of food, and if you wanted second helpings, you could have those too. And believe me, when you've got nothing else to that you can pick and choose over, then the fact that you can choose how much food to put on your plate, uh, it that. Uh, uh, begin that pile begins to get bigger and bigger, and even those with something of a sort of, you know, bird bird's appetite, the the the, the amount does begin to go up because that's where the greed goes, that's where the desire goes as well. The point being that, you know, we, we weren't hungry. Uh, we may be missing all sorts of stuff like TV and books and so forth and friends and family, but food wasn't one of them and i remember after a particularly good lunch uh, and pudding uh, going into the little commute this little community room and as i walked in there was somebody in uh, in the corner of the room uh, just who i saw as i walked in through the corner of my eye and i could see that he as i walked in he made to hide something and i immediately sort of slew around and looked to see what it was he was hiding and when he saw i wasn't anyone of consequence he pulled out a cabaret's whisk whisper bar you know chocolate bar and proceeded to eat it and it was one of those th moments when you look at somebody and they look at you and you know exactly what they're thinking uh, and the reason i knew exactly what he was thinking is that I was thinking the same sort of thing, only I wasn't doing it with chocolate bars at the time I smoked, and I used to do it with cigarettes. And it was like this. It was, uh, uh, you know, this is really tough. It's very taxing, both physically on the body, long periods of sitting still in meditation, knees hurt, back hurt, etc., and also psychologically taxing as well. And if I'm going to get through these five days, I need one little treat just one little treat to get me through and for him it was the Cadbury's whisper bar for me it was regular cigarette breaks and it was interesting you know everybody ha seemed to have a little something that as if to say you know if I can have this uh, then I will be able to get through today and you know uh, and I knew that he had chocolate bars for every single other day and indeed that's exactly what he did and that was his sort of crutch if you like and it was interesting because we do do that sort of thing we, we have this sort of inner bargaining element where you know if I've got to face something different difficult then I sort of think but at least I can have a glass of wine at the end of it you know um, and it makes me feel better. And it's a very sort of, you know, it's a very natural thing, but it's an interesting, you know, to, if, to examine that narrative, to examine that story that I'm telling myself. Because basically what I'm saying is that, you know, I, otherwise I just can't face it. Um, and, and this is where the picking and choosing comes in, because that is an example of picking and choosing. Because what happens if those chocolate bars were taken away from him? Would he have to leave? The session even though he's paid an amount of money and he's taking time off work so he's using up his holiday and he's you know paid the train fare to come down all those sort of things he so he wants to be there this is all voluntary but on the other hand you know he's 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 stuck in this narrative that that means that he he's now dependent on having this chocolate bar to allow him to get through and for me it was for the cigarettes as well what happens if suddenly i wasn't able to smoke i mean i don't smoke now but at the time i did and uh, this is the thing. This is the thing about picking and choosing. Um, the picking and choosing, if I really, if I say to myself, without that chocolate bar, without those cigarettes, I couldn't face it. Then I have ruled out going into that place. I've ruled out going on a retreat because I say, I can't do it. 
I, I can't face it without those two things. It's literally the sort of, you know, I need two, two cups of coffee or I can't face the day type mentality. And these are stories that we do tell ourselves. And these are the stories of the self. This is the story I tell myself. This is the negotiation. And the more that I cling to that story, the more frightened I become of not being able to get what I want. And if I can't get what I want, and I fear that, um, then that area becomes a no-go area. In other words, that freedom to move north, south, west, and east becomes patchwork. There's some places I can go because that's okay. I, I want to be there and I like being there. And there are other places that frighten me because they will deny me something that I feel I can't survive without. And these are the sorts of self-belief um, that uh, uh, we all have, that we all create over time. This is why uh, Master so uh, Sozan says, the great way is not difficult. It merely avoids picking and choosing because it is not partial. Um, and, and when we talk about I, when, when the Buddha says, actually, the truth is no I, what he's basically saying is this. He says, this I is limiting. This, this self-belief, the attachment to, to self-belief is limiting. It creates places that I can't go, that I won't go, that I can't face. But he says, the, the reason that I c won't go or can't go or feel that I can't go is not because it's true that I can't go there. It's because I'm frightened. I'm frightened. And this is why, you know, Master Dayu always used to say that I and fear are like the palm and the back of the one hand. 